Alright, so we've got the sponge here with a little uh, Chrysogorgia growing right next to it. Right. Science is happy, thanks. You want a close shot of yeah, that? Actually, specifically the, the thing growing on it. Push in, Daryl. It looks like it's actually getting a, a secondary colonization by some stoloniferous coral, which I had not seen further out. So these little line of polyps that are retracted is some type of stoloniferin. Not a very pretty one or a good view since their polyps are all sucked up. These can sometimes come in really vivid, pretty colors. All right, thank you. Okay, go away. Thanks. Brian, that long brown thing, is that something biological or something in the geological formation? I don't know, actually. I, w yeah. I was looking at that um, when that we were zoomed in, and I chose not to mention it because I didn't have a good answer. Okay. <laughs> it actually might be where the that stock broke off because yep. it kind of looks like a perfect match. It's definitely possible. You want another shot from this side over here? Sure. Yeah. Zoom in. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, looks like looks Coralie's like right. Piece. Yeah. Yep, no, yep. you got it. That it's was the where the, the crust separated when the coral got knocked over. Can we zoom in even more? Is this is yeah, this we can. In? Go ahead there. Go falls in there on the broken rock. Sorry, it's probably not rock. But Thank you. Okay, you know this I mean. is soft rock, so it's like some sort of carbonate or something. This does not look like basalt. So it's a carbonate that's been down here so long that it started to get a ferromanganese crust? Yeah. Well, so Brian was saying that there looks like some sort of slope feature. So I'm guessing, I don't know, is it, po is it possible for the reef to come all the way down to this depth? Yeah, I would assume so. It's definitely, it's certainly a slump. Uh, are you good with the shot? Are we mm -hmm. done? Yep. Great, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Um, I mean, we got that piece of carbonate on our watch last night at 2,500 meters or, um, more likely car carbonate that had probably <laughs> fallen down the slope. That's a, isn't that a candidate rock sample there with a? Uh, I think we're good on rock samples. On no, I think we'll, think we'll wait pass a little on bit that one. Thanks. I want to, we're going to, this head wall scarp that we're going to get to in the next couple hundred meters is trying to find the interface between that and pick up some rocks there is going to be important. All right here out here in the jumble it's a little unclear where even on the scale of like big blocks like we're looking at it might be a little less clear where it came from so i got turned around here chasing the wall i'm gonna have to uh come around to the northeast works for me. Big bamboo whip there flaying out of flame. That's one we haven't seen a lot of yet. It's kind of hard to see its nose. Looks. Or polyps. Yeah, you can't really see its polyps, but down at the base, its nodes were very clear. Are bamboo whips in the same family as regular bamboos and just grow differently? Again, I think they changed the taxonomy on me. I would have said yes, but I think they might have split some of them out. And I'm not have not internalized the latest taxonomy on that. I think they split the bamboos into a couple different families. Can uh, push in there for a minute there.
That's good for us, thanks. Okay, go away. to be the pointy end. So we got multiple big hemichoraliums here, a couple of good side polyapagon sponges, several chrysogorgias, one norella, and whatever that it is that I'm struggling to remember the name of. Which one is the Norella? Uh, the Norella is the little white thing down at the bottom um, okay. with the kind of short ones. Thank you. And then... Wait. Uh, no, it's either a uh, Calyptrophora. It's probably a Calyptrophora. All right, I think we are good here. If you've got some leash, let's go ahead and hop on up. Try to walk around and hop up. Unless you want to hop up here. No, we can we can spin around the top of the point. This is one of those times where the local, what we're seeing and uh, what we expected to see in the multi-beam right in this specific spot is not jiving. I would have expected this to have been sedimenty and flat with not a lot of life. Um, really? Yeah, because we're, if you look at high pack, we're kind of moving over this um, flat spot before we make contact with the headwall scarp. And I would have expected a pause here um, in the corals in between coming up the slope and moving over the headwall scarp. And yet, lo and behold, we're having some of the best coral we've had this expedition. And the diet plan, it says that this was a possible um, landslide, submarine landslide. Is what we're seeing fitting that hypothesis? Um, I certainly wouldn't say it's contrary to it. I don't know, Coralie, what do you think? It's kind of hard to tell. Um, I think it'd be easier to tell if I was watching the whole time. Um, but to like figure this kind of stuff out, uh, more like structural geologists will go through a bunch of pictures and go through all the videos and see the different um, changes in the morphology of the seamount. So it's something I can't really say for certain right now. Are there any set um, metrics that let you know it's a, a landslide? Um, like any good 
key characteristics. And I'm sorry, I know that's uh, probably outside of your wheelhouse. It is a little bit outside. Um, I would say, well, for one, like having the carbonate, which we know is something that's very shallow water uh, down here, which I think we have found a little bit of, um, would be a pretty good characteristic that it is falling down, especially if you see kind of these big mass wasting type of um, uh, units, so. So doing, doing large scale ge geology from ROVs is difficult because we have such a, we're looking at features that are hundreds of meters, many hundreds of meters across um, and on all axes and looking at, at, at three meters at a time windows. And so trying to match those scales with an ROV is difficult. Um, yeah, definitely. I so think a lot of geologists, once they go in, submersibles have a much better time and can actually learn a lot more. Um, which I think is kind of interesting because I've only worked with ROVs, so I don't quite understand that, but yeah. Awesome, yeah, thank I you. Tend to, I tend to hear that from people saying they have better situational awareness and viewing from inside the submersible. I've heard the same. But having never been in a submersible, it's hard for me to imagine that exactly. looking out of a six inch diameter window gives you much more perspective than the wall of screens and sonars and everything that we have um, at our disposal here. But it is a common comment from those who have done it. So until I can find my way onto an Alvin cruise, I'll take their word for it. Uh -huh. But at the, co at the cost of 10 times the cost of building and operations, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure even if there is an improvement, it's a tenfold improvement. It's really a two-dimensional world for us here, is the way I've heard it described. Yeah. So a couple more primnoids, a little hemicralium, two bathopathies in this little cluster, and as we're moving away from the uh, the promontory there at the top of that uh, little rock wall into this rock jumble, it looks like we're losing our corals real quick. This is more what I expected up here, was this type of terrain. Before we map this feature, did you have it planned out that you wanted to dive here? Uh, the overall geo, yes. Um, this particular spot, no. And actually, we're diving on previous um, ships mapping right this second. With the. Uh, area just to our large swath of this feature, both to our northwest and east, are unmapped, which we're working on in between dives. But this particular pass, uh, I don't remember what ship it came from, but was recent bathymetry, but uh, it may have even been Nautilus, but it was not um, this cruise's work. So that's one of those things that goes into pre-cruise planning is, is scouring the publicly available multi-beam archives and stuff like that. and finding all of the existing bathymetry across all the years and different projects and trying to get it all on the ship so we can make the best use of our time out here um, and not make sure we're not redoing anyone else's work. So there's a huge amount of li library and database work scouring for previous operations to make sure we are building upon them and not duplicating them since it's so hard to get out here and, and exploration is so important. We really need to do a really good job of um, building up, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants for the old cliche about science, as opposed to just kind of winging it. It's really pretty the way that Primnoid and Hemicrab and there on the bottom right are kind of growing together. I feel like I never really see that many associates on bathopathies. Is that? seems to be true there yeah. sometimes you will but it, they are far less less commonly inhabited by these big things um, than some of the other attacks are
So front row, the waypoints here um, at this point become much less important um, in terms of actually their spot. We were kind of aiming for the base of the head wall scarp and then moving up onto the scarp. The waypoints are definitely a guideline. We can follow our nose a little bit based on the terrain on exactly where we want to interface with that feature. All right. um, we're looking at 60 meter grid, I think, Bathy. So it's a pretty big plus or minus on where we're going to actually find the start of that wall. And it may not be a solid wall. It may be step terrace again, like we've been seeing. No. Um, but your interpretation of the what you're seeing will be appreciated on where we move coming up here. Roger. And where the ship can move. And where the ship can move, of course, yeah. And so if you want to that if you want to play with it, the scene for this is on MV Proc. Um, if at any point you want to play with the, the bathy, feel free to get a better sense t in three dimensions as well. Okay, thank you. How far south can you go? Or east, east. Yeah, east should be east. the the relative east, trend. Yeah, east should be the trend. Yeah, I can try an east. Okay. It, you want? That'll keep us from going down the hill. We'll kind of stay at the top of this uh, little ridge here. You want some time to get out front? Um. No, I think I'm probably going to stay south of Atlanta here as much as I can. Okay. Unless we want to go down the hill here, so. Nope. Up, I mean, we, up should be the definitely general direction of travel, yeah, unless we have to. Kind of trying to stay on the top of this little feature we've been following. That's where all the bridge now. This is a, one of those great examples of the limitation of whole mounted sonars so of what we're seeing east, here please. versus what Thank the you. ROV is experiencing is in a finer scale than what we can see from the surface. So kind of matching what we expect the general trends to be from the bathymetry versus uh, the local terrain the vehicle's experiencing uh, often mismatches. You can uh, spin 180 if you want, Ren, and look to the south. What's the scale of the map again? 30 by 30? I think this one's like 50 by 50. This is the first Parasocrinus um, we've seen. It's for a sea star. Uh, and, oh, and there's our first uh, Metallogorgia as well. So as we move out into the um, kind of flatter area, flatter being very much relative, um, still pretty steep, but we're picking up some of these um, taxa that seem to do better in flatter terrain. I'll have to come down a bit for me now. I'm stretching it out. Can we look at yellow when you get a little leash? Right. It. Just a little bit tighter for me. Yeah, so this is, um, six months ago I would have called this a plexorid. Um, the taxonomy has been reorganized recently, and so I believe this is in the family Paramercia Day. Uh, and within Paramercia Day, it's really hard to tell the genera apart. Um, so we'll just leave it at a family ID. Um, and this I believe is only the second Paramercia we've seen on this watch, or Paramercia Day, excuse me. All right, thanks, Dan. You want a tight shot there while we're yeah, here? Yeah, if you've got, if you got more. Well. Yeah, Daryl's got more. Looks like it's got one something living on it, but I can't tell what it is. All right, Dan. Looks 
looks like the current's picking up quite a bit. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, thanks, Darrell. Louise polyopagon sponges, followed by what looks like a calabacus sponge. Have these been documented other elsewhere in the world besides um, around the Indonesia area and here? Oh yeah. Um, okay. The what's a little bit different here than what I'm used to seeing is how thick the attachment points are. Um, the sponges are, pr are relatively common, but um, those big tufts we were seeing uh, two dives ago is what, I, what I've only remember seeing one other in Indonesia. Um, and this one has a pretty good size attachment point too, but it's not like, I mean, the, we have seen those like two or three meter attachment points with three or four growth areas is what was really odd the other day. It's something like this. It's got a big attachment area, but isn't like I've definitely seen this size um, oh, in please. numerous places. Awesome, thank you. And a little. Push in just a bit there, Darren. You can see how they aggregate sand here as well. They change the flow dynamics and the sand settles out there as well. Can we look at the little Chrysogorgia um, about two meters um, further up? Sure. Two meters up. Yep. It's very spindly right there. Right there. I'm gonna pull you a little bit here, maybe. Or not. I think I got it. Uh, push in there, Drew. Another one of those Chrysogorgias with its uh, Europe Tychus um, squat lobster in it. This is a very um, small polyp. As generally, generally, I think of Chrysogorgias having these dainty little polyps, and um, and across the, all of the Chrysogorgias, um, but this particular species as is even finer boned than uh, than most. Look at the eyes on that thing. This, this is a great angle. Can we zoom tight on the associate on the squat lobster? Sure. I know it's rotating in the breeze, but Just one of the ways you identify these things um, is by their mouth parts, which is exceedingly hard to get a good still shot on when they're so small Full zoom, and, yeah. um, and hiding in the coral. This is one of our rare opportunities to get a, a good look at the, the uh, structure of their mouth, which is one of the diagnostic criteria between the different species in this genus uh, and uh, how pointy the rostrum on their head is. You can just barely see between its those glowy orbs that are its eyes. There's a little uh, a little protrusion of a rostrum kind of thing there. And the size of that also is important in understanding what species it is. You can also see in this shot, we're nice and tight, the kind of gold colored skeleton that gives this group their common name of gold corals. 
um, but not to be confused with the zoanthid cold coral, which is doesn't have a skeleton um, and is kind of gold in color. And so we have two gold color, two types of um, nominally gold corals that are very not very closely related to each other that we can find out here. Great job tracking the movement. Um, oh, for proportional control. Yeah. All right, I think I got what I need here. Thanks. Okay, you can go wide text. If you're still waiting for a little leash, let's take a look at the sponge. Sure. Go ahead, there. I'm way off to the south. So. Yeah, I think you're going to start getting pulled. All right, that's yeah. good for us. Thanks. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh. It's a little, I think, unless the ship slides south. Can she do? I think she can do a one three five. I could give you one zero zero. Maybe 110. <laughs> <laughs> right here, 110. How about 115? How about 110? <laughs> Roger. Do you want that now, or you want to get out front a little bit? Um, yeah, so... Can we quick zoom on the black coral right there? Yeah, go ahead there. How do you know this is a black coral from so far away? Uh, is it the coloration? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's hard to tell. I guess just 40 expeditions of looking at corals. Um, 40? Yeah, I think uh, something like that. Um, yeah, so that's some type of um, potentially trisopathies or heteropathies. And then that's a predatory tunicate right next to it. All right, that's all I need. Thanks. Right. Okay. Or staropathies, actually, probably what that is. Um, yeah, let me poke around here, but I think it's, if we don't go southish a little, we'll be out in the sand pile here. Maybe I can, can see an Atlantis view there. Let's Oops, watch the tether. Yeah, bonk. What'd you do that for? That's good. We're fine. Just took a bounce there. So I think your the the overall feature is definitely the north is where the large scale bathymetry is going to get higher. So we may just I think we're better off eating the sand crossing now <laughs> and uh, <laughs> making some path and trying to stay with this local ridge if we need to go down and in the sand for a minute or two I think that'll pay off in the long run Roger. sand it is it's a lot of sand well, let's go look at some sea pens Yeah, so this this ridge that we're or that we're just coming off of, we're coming down off of, does not show up in any way, shape, or form in the um, the ship-based bathymetry. Uh, can you come down for a minute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Come down.
Okay, should be able to come up there. A BC, and you'll have to uh, spin back around to the east. having a hard time coming around on the breeze there. Brian, I know you mentioned this before, talked about it before. And when we're looking at the bed forms, the uh, the waves in the land in the sand, you said if they're tight together it means a strong current or is that the opposite? So if they're, the bigger they are, the stronger the current. Um, oh, here's a little umbalula. Um, so That's if they're very parallel, um, and then the size, parallel means steady current or steady flow direction. Jumbled or curved means variable flow. Um, and then the shape of them, if they're symmetrical, it's probably wave action flowing back and forth. If they're asymmetrical it's probably unidirectional current uh, and then the overall size indicates the strength of the current flow awesome thank you can we take a look at this little whip right there right there yeah, push in there now So this is, I believe, a C-pen, probably a prototelum. Go ahead, Bridge. I did, thanks. All right, that's good, thanks. OK, you can go in. Seeing this on our sonar, what's up with that thing? Can you uh, crank up the gain on this guy and play with the uh, Two other settings there that you can tweak. Crank that up to 50. Go ahead, Bridge. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, then you can adjust the contrast a bit so we get some returns. So we and if we can quick bit. zoom on the coral when you're happy before we leave the spot. Right there. Go ahead, Daryl. Hemi Corallium. Thanks. That's all I needed. Okay. Go ahead. Took we got a little sand on our porch. You can also play with the one that says 6 dB. I can turn that up or down. We should be getting a like, boom in returns there. So we got a little metallogorgia up here on top. Um, and I can't quite tell what these two are. And, uh, push in there now. So that's Norella in the background. And then some type of whip bamboo here in the foreground. All right, that's good, thanks. Okay, I can go away. Little cluster of anthemastis babies down there in the bottom right. And 
probably looks like a little cluster of black corals here, or maybe one black coral. Can we get a tight on the big coral on the left, please? Yeah, absolutely. Gonna have a little sand coming off the porch there, but Kadao, you can push in there a bit for us. a big primnoid, some dead areas of skeleton, a few associates, but not that many. Looks like a couple hydroids or some hydroids, crinoid. Not really many brittle stars, which is a little unusual. There's one. All right, that's good, thanks. Okay, moving on. Ooh, big roll. Not a big from now with several. Did that sonar, but it's not working. It should be uh, lighting up that rock like crazy. Dan, can we go nestle the vehicle somewhere in this general vicinity and then fire a Niskin? Sure. Get right in between these two rocks with all the corals? Sure. After we fire the Niskin, let's start looking for a rock. Right so we got a really high density, our high diversity community here. Um, see just about most of the major taxa here. We've got Chrysogorgias in multiple flavors. We've got Primnoids in multiple flavors. We've got Paramaricias. We've got Anthemastus. We've got what, probably a couple bamboos behind us. So we've got a whole host of different things here. Um, um, and, uh, and so we're gonna take an eDNA sample here. Um, while we also look at this beautiful Chrysogorgia right here. Are those Paramaris aids too? Yep. Come down, come down. Right. Balance on a marble here somewhere, it's not happy. And this this spot I pointed at is not magical. I just thought it was a nice hurt. I, I, I 
convinced I was wrong. I thought it was a nice herc sized spot to land. We could just be anywhere close in this area. Yeah, it's just, I don't know what's. Brian, key question of the whole expedition. Why do you think this spot has so many, uh, so many types of coral, so much life? This particular spot, I don't know. That is one of the things that scientifically drives me crazy. It, I, uh, I don't have a really good mechanistic answer. I mean, the big picture an answer is probably the current here is ideal for corals, um, broadly. But what that actually Sit means in, there, in terms Fold of periodic flow, steady flow, speed of flow, you know, all those kind of things I don't have answers for. Um, and that is something that, you know, I will I would say it's one of the major drivers of some of my research questions is trying to understand that particular question of why this rock and not that rock um, when it comes to these corals. Awesome. Thank you. Really cool shot of the individual polyps of this um, Chrysogorgia here. Yeah. Hoping Herc would settle out there, but I'm still balanced on a marble somewhere. Are you going to be able to reach around the coral to get to the Niskin poles? Yeah, I hope so. I think so, yeah. Bet the DSC is not lined up for this one. For the no, unfortunately not. But this is a really cool Sorry, close up shot of yeah. the polyp. Good shot really of a cool. rock. <laughs> okay, go wide there. <laughs> uh, can you turn on the pen and tilt light? Or, uh, what Niskins do we have? Niskin 4 looks good. What's that? Niskin 4. Uh, they've pulled the yellow one. Oh. Right. Here. Are you full white there, Dara? Go. Yep. What's that sample number data? Sample one two eight. One two eight. Here we have the famous Green River Dive Knife. Can you uh, open up the box a little bit there? That's good. Oh, 
quarrel peeking out there. He's trying to escape. Great, making it worse. Nothing. This must be one of those sticky coils. Yeah, it is. It's a bamboo. They are very mucusy. Bargain for. Downwind here and <coughs> try and blow some of this sand off the porch. That'd be a futile effort. Take the slurp and just vacuum yourself off. <laughs> Can you uh, turn off the uh, pen and tilt light disruptor? Roger. That's going to be with us for a while. Nice rock. Lots of lots of life, lots of diversity. Is it my imagination or is the water quality down here just not as good as usual? I mean, I realize you just dusted off a whole bunch of stuff, but just looking in the Atalanta view, it just feels like yeah, it's, it's a little murky. Seems to be a little murky. Maybe that's why there's so many uh, corals down here. Definitely possible. It's a coral food.
We're sprinkling the uh, fairy dust along the way here off of our porch. Okay, Ryan, you gotta fix that sonar for me. Try turning that ADB down and then turn the contrast up. Something's not very useful. Though. These whips look a little different. These are actually, I think these are actually primnoid whips. Can you give me a little bit more? Yep. Yeah. Go right in there. Yep. These are some type of primnoid whip. All right. Thanks. And can we rotate counterclockwise around this boulder as we leave? I think there's a Victor Gorgia on the other side. All right. I see it. I see it. So this is our first Victor Gorgia of the dive. Looks like there might be some just going out of frame on the right too. Yeah, I agree. And if we can take a snap zoom on the... Yeah, go ahead there. Most of the ones we've seen have been this lighter color purple um, on this expedition. Oh, come on, Hart. Does right. science know what leads to that dark purple? Nope. All right, that's good, things. No, color in the deep sea okay, is, go away. is a really interesting question in an area with um, little to no light or whatever light does exist here is from bioluminescence. Um, and yet we have such a wide range of colors. Like you can kind of justify the reds pretty easily because the reds um, um, attenuate with um, with the red is the first color to attenuate in the um, spectrum. So the reds are harder to see, um, yeah. but all the other colors we see down here are a little harder to explain evolutionarily why we get so much color or why things like the squat lobsters are um, are color camouflaged with their host down, corals okay. when it comes to the, the uh, Europtychus and their uh, Chrysogorgias is something that doesn't make sense. Do you think this is a potential application for the Roman spectrometer to help uh, analyze color in the deep sea? It'll certainly help us um, document the color, yes. Um, and potentially help us be able to identify these corals at greater ranges from like an AUV or something if we can run around and, <coughs> you know, upgrade the, the, the next generation or a couple generations down the road on the spectrometer, have it as a line scanner where it covers a, a 
you know, a wider a fan instead of a single point, we might be able to you know, get a sense of what things fluoresce at what colors and from a much greater distance at much quicker speed be able to say, oh, that's a Victor Gorgia or something like that. So yeah, I think as that kind Push of that there, class too. of technologies develop, it has a lot of opportunities to help us, uh, or a lot of potential to help us um, document the deep sea organisms at a, a faster and more efficiently. So this looks like a hemicorallium on the top and then probably some type of cuskeel fish here on the bottom right. And we've got some kind of little baby coral in there that we're never going to be able to identify. It's too small. I can uh, try to zoom there. Yeah, that's a baby hemicorallium. I was talking about the super thin one off to the left. Hmm. That is barely visible. Just looking at the fish. Okay, go ah. away. Uh, I'm not sure what baby we're looking I, at. We're really not going to be able to tell. Right. I promise. Um, all right. I think we're good here. Thanks. Okay. I forgot. We're seeing these two different types of Chrysogorgias here quite commonly in this area these much taller, kind of sparser branches and these tight little bottle brush varieties. Can we look at this one, please? All right. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can get down there. I can zoom in there. I don't think I need much of a look. I just need a little bit tighter than I got. Sorry. Come on, Hart. Come out. Uh, go away for me. I lost it. Yeah, let me come around. It's not working. Okay, you can push in there, there. All right, yep, this is a black coral. All right, thanks. I was struggling to tell if it was a rock pen or a black coral. Just a quick mid-watch update. Oh, we're about halfway through our watch. Um, I don't know how much you really want to get to the top of this. Our final waypoint is about 1,000 meters away. We've made about 100 meters progress so far. All right. Sounds like we should go a little faster then. But there's so many corals. There are a lot of corals. Waypoint. <laughs> right we can cut a corner here if the ship can move it, and we don't have to make it to seven, but I do want to make it up the wall by the end of the dive. So we've got a little flexibility to shorten it up a bit if the ship can make that more northeasterly move, um, which we don't need to do now yet, but th an option for probably the next watch to consider. Yeah, let the next watch. <laughs> but yeah, we should pick up the pace a little bit though. <laughs> Navigator slash schedule keeper. <laughs> 100 meters, really? That's all we've got. 100 meters. <laughs> really? <laughs> that's pretty lame. Yeah, that's shockingly bad. <laughs> Easily distracted. Okay. But it is always the age old, age old um, tension on this type of exploration is 
doing a really good job of documenting what we see versus covering enough ground for it to be um, um, before we get, uh, sorry, got distracted by messages in the chat, um, but the tension being between doing a really good job of documenting every little thing and covering enough area to document larger patterns. that AUV swimming around. Yeah, that would be nice. So Kevin, do you, the judgment here is how close to get to the base of the, the wall um, before we take the rock. I totally agree, we should get a rock before we get up on the wall. But I'm, my confusion right now is whether or not we are really in the wall feature enough or if we are still far enough away, it looks like we're good 70 to 100 meters before where the ship's bathy says we should be hitting the wall. Seems somewhat consistent with the Atalanta sonar as well. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to come to the uh, northeast here. At least stretch the tether out. All right. Wait, come for it. We need a quick zoom there. We need a bumper sticker for Herc when Dan's driving. I break for cup corals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe not. Okay. Some Sorry. type of anthemastus, but a weird looking one. Corley, how do you feel about a rock? I feel great. Um, we want to pick up one here. Maybe one over there, too. These all look... That one looks really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pick up that rock. Where are you in? If it's possible to get the bigger one on, on the top, this one. Oop. Yeah. What do we have for large rock storage capability? Else. We had Biobox F. Okay. So starboard Biobox towards yeah. aft. F and Omega are both and open Omega. for large rocks. That one probably fit in one of the uh, smaller ones as well. No, the fall ones are all full. Are they? Maybe it's bigger than it looks. Am I good to come? Oh. Am I good to enable? Sure. Copy that. I'm going to zoom in on that rock before he uh, victimizes it with the manipulator. Is your uh, grip force set to nine? Indeed it is. Roger. Is it uh, that one right there or one to the right? That one right. Copy. Sorry, that one. Yes. a victory roll out there in the light. Is that a worm on the attached to the end of it? Looks like something. I didn't, couldn't tell what yet. Bonus biology. Okay, where do you want it? Are they, uh, you guys happy with the victory roll there? Yep. One of the big boxes there. Either one, either one. Copy. Oh wait, there's a rock in the forward one. Yeah, the, there's a rock in the forward starboard bio box. So we gotta so go on the aft one? Go the aft one. Yeah. Roger.
sample salvo? Uh, not right now. All right. Brent has graduated to the next level. No sample salvo required. That one there? No. Nope. Oh, aft. aft. Aft copy. Aft Box for aft. The other big one. Data is that one two nine. Roger, one two nine. Thank you. Come on, get over there. Pitch actuator is your friend. Good advice, Dan. Bombs away. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> you really had me on the edge of my seat there. For <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> the whole room. Nicely done, man. That's probably your biggest rock yet, huh? I think two rocks ago was bigger, but it was a lot really? less smooth. Was now, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, the big, big rock. You said it was small and then we went to pick it up and it was very challenging should never trust rov pilots they lie Now. Yeah, right a bit more. Can we move to zero meters, zero seven five, please? Thank you. Are we go good to go off blue there? Uh, I think it might come up on the shoulder just a bit. Copy. How uh, about there? Works for me. Okay, blue's coming off. Right there. Seem to be a little bit heavier all of a sudden. Just you, must, you must have a leak. Yeah. Two different uh, genuses of um, genera of um, primnoids here with the hemi crab in the foreground. That's a heavy rock. I'm gonna come off like five percent there. So this, this beautiful primnoa we're looking at here is in the genus Cliptophora. This is probably Cliptophora lyra. I know, I went to species level. It's a big day. Uh, with a couple associates here. Uh, an enemy on the left and probably a couple smaller enemies here on the right. And uh, we're ready to go whenever you've got some motion on. Sure. Go for a uh, polyp zoom there, Daryl, while we float by. Yeah, 
uh, a redigorgia in the back. And yep, and then a redigorgia hanging out in the sand in the background, or near the sand. Ooh, there's a little uh, coralivorous jellyfish. Two of them. Can you make a coralivory note for me too? NC log. Just make a coralivory. Yeah. Those guys are actually eating the polyps. That is our current hypothesis, yeah. They're like covering the whole polyp, I think. Yep, that's what we think they're doing. Hmm. Wanna keep it moving, Dan? Yes, please. Bridge nav. Can we have another step? Two zero zero seven five, please. Thank you. Yeah, we first we first noticed these in 2017 in the Phoenix Islands, and uh, started and then we started looking for them in other video from other projects and started finding them all across the Pacific. They seem to be pretty pretty evenly distributed across the entire Central Pacific, um, and we've been trying to get enough of them to think about a species description. Have they been found in the Atlantic or in the Indian? Not that I'm aware of. But, but I have to admit, I haven't gone it? personally looking in those in, in dives in those areas. This might be. This is the first time I remember seeing them on primno on a primnoid. See, generally you look for them on bamboos and uh, chrysogorgids. That totally might be bias of where I've been looking. Because they're very easy to miss. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Another big primnoid here. Still heavy. Sorry, forgot that move the camera. Guess you're gonna have to blow the ballast tanks. I have to. Probably have to on the way up. Hey, uh, Chris, would you make a note in the jellyfish collections from um, that they made on the last watch? Would you, if they got to on the sample sheet mm -hmm. in the slope jar, um, would you put a question mark of one in ethanol, one in formalin? Question mark. Brian, what's the difference between formalin and ethanol for preserving a sample? Um, formalin sometimes on gelatinous organisms preserves the tissue better. And you can't use it for genetics or anything once it's preser preserved in formalin. So we kind of default to um, ethanol. Uh, ethanol always. But since they got, if they got two, I think it might be worth um, putting one in formalin. Nice paramaricia of some type. We're 
just looking at. comes the sun. It's getting bright outside. It was a beautiful full moon last night. Yeah, it really was. It was nice to actually see, like, stars. Yeah, it was. And moon. It's been very cloudy. Um, Do you know if there's an effect of the moon down in the deep sea on corals, like there is in the shallow water ones? No. Do we know that? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we do know that, that tidal currents do occur down here, though, and so they would be a w they could be aware of tidal flow changes and stuff. So it is totally possible that there is uh, an effect on the lunar cycle in the deep sea. Um, I know that some internal wave breakings and current flows and stuff like that are tidally driven. Um, so I wouldn't be at all surprised if there was some kind of um, circadian rhythm. Uh, on certain deep sea organisms based on tidal cycle or moon cycle. Can we go look at the sponge, please? Yeah, I'll head it that way. So oh, I've got okay. to turn my. A couple different Cryphogorgias. Can I stick it um, out? Jerky. It looks like Metallogorgia, several Hemichoraliums, and some type of glass sponge over here. down five. Come down ten. Alright. So I think this is that polyopagon we've been seeing, but from a distance I thought it was different and it had such so much fewer attachment spicules. Um, but no, I think this is that same one we've been seeing all day. Go for a zoom there, Daryl. Let's get sponge since, zoom in a while. we've got a second, yeah. And what, so this um, this type of sponge Go full zoom a there. lot of times have um, things living inside of them. Like not even just like surface anything, but you actually, if you sit here for a minute, you'll start seeing uh, organisms running around inside um, the sponge, like deep in the body of it. Mantis shrimps and other types of um, polychaetes and things like that. Okay. Yep, science is happy, thanks. Can go away, thanks. Seem to be going the wrong way again. Somehow got turned around. Not sure how I did that. Oh, I'll go to the south of the on the rocky side.
science, are you happy with a approximately 075 trajectory or did you want to try to head more north to get into that slope quicker? Um, no, nope. 075 looks good to me. Okay. The terrain we're seeing is so not keeping up with the bathy. Uh, let's just head on whatever is kind of easiest for the ship for the moment and make the next watch deal with the hard decisions about how to make up time. <laughs> Roger. Milk it to the next watch whenever possible. Sorry, guys. And girls. Just flying over a rat tail there. And one of these parasocrinus. I think it's the third or fourth we've seen. But compared to the earlier dives where they were just everywhere, it's been a very crinoid light day. Keep moving here unless you call for a zoom. Yep, nope, let's get you back in good position. You really were wandering off the reservation there, weren't you? Oh boy. Got a metallic gorgia and probably some type of bolosoma. Oh, not ball so long. All right, we're good. Just if you want to keep going. Right. Can I ID both those pretty well. Good size rat tail. It's been a very not fishy expedition. Seen any bathosaurus? Only. Yeah. Very few. Very few fish across this entire expedition. Part of that's the depth ranges. We've been mainly, actually completely deeper than a thousand meters. So fish become more sparse the deeper you go. Um, as a general rule, there are some exceptions, but still I'm surprised how few fish we've seen. And a snailfish is the deepest fish uh, known to man? Alan Jamison's group just documented it some like 8,000 meters plus or minus, something like that, is the deepest record of one. Since snailfish are found in the Pacific, do we find them over here? Yeah, we totally can. Probably deeper than we are currently. But yeah, you absolutely can find um, members of that genus around here. You ready for a move, Dan? Sure. Bridge, nav. Can we have three zero meters, zero seven five, please? Thank you. Can, uh, spin around to your left for me. left a little bit more for me. And you can uh, come down a bit as I stretch it out here. A gorgia, a couple more sponges, an old couple dead sponge at attachment points. As we move over this little rock outcropping in the middle of a sand pit, trying to find the wall. I 
this big stocked crinoid here as well. All these kind of organisms that are found in a little bit lower current areas, or these flatter areas. You see there's the sand ripples are, and the patterning in the bed forms is kind of disappearing here, out here in this flat spot. all this video again, right? Or you have your kids watch it? We'll see. Um, uh, it's actually a question I've got I to get a better understanding is Jeff Drazen's lab at uh, UH has been doing a lot of annotations on the Papa and Amakuakea work from Nautilus. And I'm actually not sure if the plan is for his group to do the annotations or not. So yeah, I'm Meg hoping... Megan has been watching all of our stuff again. Yeah. Annotating. Yeah, She's so I'm hoping... AI going there. Yeah, I'm hoping Megan and Jeff are going to do it for me. Um, <laughs> I It's a mixture. Um, I definitely have students annotate it sometimes, but on certain dives and certain areas, depending on what project I'm going to do, I annotate it. No. Um, and uh, so, but I'm really hoping the that Jeff's lab will do the annotations as part of, they've, they've got a workflow, they've got a team, they've got a whole bunch of QA processes and all the software and everything. They're, they're machines for blowing through specific uh, annotations. So I'm hoping that they'll do the annotations and then I can take the annotated data and start layering in with um, other uh, physical oceanography and stuff like that and looking at the different um, kind of ecological questions based on their annotations. I think Megan is still uh, a couple cruises behind. Uh, can you get a quick zoom there? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I'll take them a, several, a year or two to get a, to get through these, I'm sure. Um, but Scott France's lab at University of Louisiana Lafayette has been taking care of um, the Atlantic cruises from Okeanos, and Jeff Drazen's lab has been taking care of the Pacific cruises for um, Nautilus, and I believe is planning to continue with um, <coughs> Okeanos cruises once that now that they're back in the Pacific. This is a nice little urchin. It's the first one we've seen on this dive. Do you want to go tight on him while we're right up here? I have to admit, I hate annotating video. It's can't wait till the computers can do it. Right. Okay. Can go wide. And there's a there's a group, there's a partnership. It's a couple different institutions, but primarily between the Monterey Bay Research Institute and the Ocean Discovery League, <coughs> has a big uh, National Science Foundation award for um, building the Open Vision AI system, <coughs> and it's a three part system um, to help train um, neural networks to identify deep sea organisms. So they're fathom net. Uh, is the reference data set. So they're trying to collect a thousand images yes, of every single deep sea organism um, into a database that could be used to train um, the computer programs. And then they're building a video portal that will allow users to be able to use uh, pre-trained algorithms. And then they're trying to build a uh, community science, pro citizen science project game to help get um, individuals to help provide feedback on the um, the IDs the computer make and so it's a really it's a really awesome project I have super high hopes yeah. um, over the next 18 months or so that they're really gonna move the needle on how well um, the the computer algorithms can identify these things at least to the family level and if we can get them to identify that it's a coral and tag it to family um, That'll go a long way of being able to just automatedly sort all the primnoids into a folder and then send the still images of the primnoids to a primnoid expert and just have them blow through um, what the genus uh, genera are. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that project. When do you think the release date for that? <coughs> so Fathomnet, 
FathomNet is open now, collecting images uh. um, for reference. It's it, they're hoping to do. I think the ver it, it's out in the second phase of beta now, and they're hoping to release the version 1.0 like next month. Really? Um, yeah, and then um, I believe they're aiming for the first beta release of the video portal in the next two months. I've seen the first mock-up of what it the, what the user interface on it looks like. And then Fathomverse, which is the game citizen science version, I think they're aiming for a beta release in like September, October. Awesome. So it's, it's all happening really quickly. Do you think it will eventually get to the point where we can have that, have that running real time? Eventually, yes. Um, the catch is that you have to train each classifier on each taxa, basically. And so I think we're a long way from having to be able to do all the things in real time. But if you train a classifier or two specifically for corals or sponges, yeah, I don't see any reason if we've got the computing horsepower. Um, and a lot of the computing horsepower like, is on the training. Once the data set is trained, um, a raspberry pi and a coral. Yeah, the classifier works on 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 a laptop kind of thing. Yeah. Seeing some of that Atlanta Stella sponge we were seeing a lot yesterday. A couple um, different Chrysogorgias here. What did you say that Can orange thing was? Can we look the yeah, predatory sea star piece? I see it. Uh. I see it. Come around see if we can get a shot of the uh, gross site. Is that another cloud Yep. If you will make a note of that, I'd appreciate it. Come on. Is that a bamboo pole? Not sure yet. Mm -hmm. okay. I would say it's probable, but... Come up here and let it clear out. The mm -hmm. primnoids have been tricking me tonight. Sponges in the way to get right downstream of it. But oh. Okay, Daryl. Go tight there on the C star. Perfect lineup on the uh, still cam too. Yep. Yep. So this is a bamboo being snacked on by um, a C star. And then these are one of the larger coralivores or coral predators we're aware of. Predator. Some colleagues of mine at BU and at um, the Salk Institute at Scripps are doing looking at the immune response of these corals um, and how they handle being eaten on and whether that um, really affects the uh, immunity uh, across the entire coral um, and how it weakens it. So we're taking special effort to kind of get these good images for that group and their research. Right, can the polyps regrow? Things. Like, is there a trace of polyp left that can possibly regrow, or is it just completely gone? In theory, it could. Um, but generally, so it, it depends on how bad the damage is. It's something like this, where the sea star is probably just eating everything and lawnmower in the entire thing. Um, I think regrowth is pretty unlikely in the more of the thing of the jellyfish we were looking at earlier that picks off an individual polyp and it's fully surrounded. Uh, it has a much higher likelihood of being able to regrow. It's a surface area to volume thing, basically. Um, 
and we see that same um, in shallow water. You know, if a crown of thorns comes in and mows down an entire half a colony, the odds of that colony fully recovering are low. If you have a butterfly fish come and pick one polyp, the odds of that polyp recovering are high. All right, Dan, I think we've got what we need. Thanks. Are there, okay, go awesome, right, thanks. thank you. Do the corals have any kind of defense, or are they just completely vulnerable? They, to I don't think they have a mechanical or stinging defense necessarily, but it is very possible they have certain uh, taxa may have developed um, toxins or bad tasting compounds or something like that. Um, the distribution of what we see being eaten um, definitely not all corals are eaten at the same rate. Bamboos tend to be eaten more often. Um, so I think certain taxa probably have developed chemical defense defenses of some type. But again, we don't actually know what or how yet. Roger. Thank you. In the shallow waters, the crown of thorns have preferences for certain corals, but it doesn't seem to be consistent as far as we can tell. Yeah, it, it, the, the patterns of coral livery are super strange in shallow water where they're better understood. Like yeah. something I, I actually tried to do a dissertation chapter on, but COVID got in the way of, um, was trying to better understand um, pay, prey preference in um, parrotfish. And there's a, a Caribbean coral, Orbicella annularis, that is um, tasty to um, parrotfish, but certain heads certain individual colonies are far tastier than others. And you'll see one head that has just literally got a hundred parrotfish bites on it, and there'll be a head right next to it of exactly the same coral with zero bites on it. Um, and previous work by Randy Rogen and others um, has really tried to figure out the difference, and the, nothing they have tried has explained it. The protein contents are the same, the endosymbionts are the same, the carbohydrate concentrations are the same. Uh, none of the obvious, um, like me metabolic things they could test, explained why certain heads just clearly are tastier than others. Um, and so that's a still a big question mark in shallow water coral reef ecology of what controls at least parrotfish um, prey preference when it comes to corals. Is there a possibility of fish personality? Like, um, since there's been so much work done on fish psychology, that just kind of like humans, one will follow after the other. Yep, that, that is totally possible that there's like, once the biting starts, they recognize it as food. Um, the hypothesis I wanted to test was some kind of spatial relationship in the water column. Like, was this coral head in an area where fish more often trans transited to go from one part of the reef to the other, so it was just more likely to you know, stop at the McDonald's on the corner on your commute to work versus going three blocks off of your commute to get uh, another store um, was the hypothesis I wanted to test. Uh, and then I lost half my field time and couldn't, couldn't run a multi-year study on it. So I pivoted to a different project. Coming under you there. Can we take a quick look at the Z the C pen that's flying off to the left? Uh right it. Where'd he go? Uh. Yep, that's another prototelum. That's all I needed, thanks. Right it. Oh wow, look at that coral sponge is building up an entire mound of sand. Hmm. I don't need a tight zoom, that's enough, thanks. I'm trying to be good on, on my commitment to make some tracks. <laughs> right, sure. Making tracks.
which way you're going to spin. Looks like we got a little baby solitary hydroid over on the left too. Just a teeny one. So, uh, quick zoom on the hydroid while sure. coming around here. There. Just a quick one. Just a baby. I have high expectations now that we saw that absolutely massive one. <laughs> <laughs> that one was huge. <laughs> okay, go away, Tex. And here comes the corals to the right. There's a rock with a lot of life on here, right? If you keep right. spinning. All right. It. Come up another five there for me. Right, directly under it. What do we have here? Is that a big stalked crinoid over there? That's my guess, yeah. Yep, Prasocrinus, Chrysogorgia, a couple feather stars, a couple more of these uh, very um, long attachment point sponges. Is the ship stopped? Yes. Could we maybe take a sample of this coral piece? Sure. Uh, bottom brush? Uh, nope, top one. This tall uh, one. Uh. We've gotten a good look at that a couple times, and I'm struggling. I'm still struggling to place it. Probably not. It's pretty bushy. Do you want to put that in with the rock, or do you want to put it in its own? Yeah, let's. It can go in with. Uh, oh. Yeah, let's do that one. Okay. Uh -huh. So we've been seeing this this uh, this coral. We've been seeing a lot on this dive, and it's not one we have seen a lot this expedition. And I'm sure it's in the fam uh, the genus Chrysogorgia, but the species identification is a little different, a little hard, and since this is something we have, it's kind of unique to this dive, I want to make sure we get the uh, ID correct. You're all push in there, Daryl. This isn't a bottle brush Chrysogorgia? So the bottle brush Chrysogorgia is, is, a, is several species. Um, okay. That we kind of, this, that, this growth form we refer to as a bottle brush. Gotcha. Um, but these polyps Push are tight redder, for a minute. Fatty, fatter, and this whole organism is taller. So what I kind of consider the standard bottle brush Full is zoom. actually the one that's bottom left out of zoom, out of focus, or out of the right. view right now. Okay. 
Um, and th I'm pretty sure this is a known species. I'm just not 100% sure which one. And then that being said, that's all based on morphology. And the more we run genetics on these things, the more we realize that um, the morphology is wrong or our morpho morphological understanding of the relationships is wrong. Where do you want to put this sample? Is it going to be a starboard box? Or yeah, we think we can put this on top of the rock that um, Ren collected last in the um, aft large box on the starboard side. Got it. I think we can tell this apart from a rock. Ren, can you, um, do you know how to isolate the thruster? Uh, I don't think so, no. Let me try that before we get, uh, See what happens when I turn this guy off before him. Looks like we're gonna hold on one bird. Okay. Which of them do you want there, Brian? Uh, you know, standard 10 centimeters or so. All right. Yeah. This Push has got so many, so many different branches. We don't need like a full 10 centimeters, but just the top. All right. A few branches. Actually, I'm going to change that on you. Sorry, I thought that through. So four, at least four branching points, which still should be about 10 centimeters, but these often have a repeating branching point um, pattern, and the angle at which each branch leaves um, the central branch is diagnostic. Okay. So, like, if you want to snip right there, would be just about perfect. that branch or in front? Yeah, behind. So a little more to the left. Perfect. Right there? Yep. Some in a jaw that wasn't snippy. Ed shrimps just hang out there. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot for them to um, want to leave. There you go. Got it. Great. I'm ready on the box when you are, Dan. That's perfect. Okay, can zoom back in on the shrimp there while we put this guy away. Uh, we said the aft box, did we? Yeah, aft. Uh, yep. On top That's of the good rock. There. Good, good. Uh, come back in a little bit. Copy. I don't know if he's going to float or sink here. 
Uh, it should sink slowly. Right uh, close the box a little bit. Okay, that's good. Must be a rock in there. There is a rock in there. <laughs> Fair bit of current there, so sink, come on, baby, sink. Looks oh, like it's still on your, yep. Uh, one piece sank and okay. one piece is going to, you One piece is fine. You want to take it out? I think one piece, I'm not sure. Um, fair bit of current there. <laughs> Yeah, I guess if I definitely saw one piece fly away, so let's take another snip, right. just to be sure. I have that thruster isolated, but I think it's the, uh, uh, it might be my lateral. Let me make an adjustment here. some lateral on there that was killing us. Not too much there. That no, should be fine. That's good. Close, close a little bit. Uh, open to this a little bit more. About how long have we been uh, utilizing ROV, ROVs to explore the deep sea?
trying to think. Um, they really started in earnest in the 70s, I think. Okay, I think that one is in the box. But really, you know, early 90s was when they started really becoming a useful science tool. 80s into 90s. Was there expansion led by science or led by like um, oil and gas industries? Both. Um, I mean, it, it's an interesting, the industry science kind of partnership is a lot of times the basic science gets done to come up with the engineering and then you need a commercial entity to see the promise of the results of basic science to get it into kind of Hold production. Uh, and then science gets it back after it's kind okay. of a pro production level area. So it's kind of an interesting trade back and forth. We NASA has um, demarcated the yeah. is a very soft um, compound. What is it? Is it a rock? Is it a mineral? What is the actual crust? The like, crust? What's, what's it classified as? It's I'm, it's a rock. Um, it's specifically classified as iron and manganese oxide, but they're in a kind of amorphous form. Okay. Um, and there's a bunch of different random mineral names that they've given to the That's iron and manganese oxides. Catfish we just scared up. <sighs> Catfish? Bat. Oh. Uh, like push in there a bit, Forrester. 